I would like to thank the Duluth Bible Church for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I am not able to be there in person, but I am thankful for the opportunity. Uh, I've done some uh, uh, video uh, cam stuff using my computer, and I've presented a, a PowerPoint to help you walk through the issue today of the historical development and decline of dispensationalism. I did want you to know that I am uh, scheduled to come in uh, this weekend for uh, the later conference and Saturday afternoon, Lord willing, I'll be speaking on Arno C. Gabelein, one of the uh, early 20th century dispensationalists. Uh, but for now, we're talking about the historical development and decline of dispensationalism. Uh, and I, I want to let you know at the outset that I have a two-edged sword that I'm going to bring to the session today. I'm going to say yes, dispensationalism has some uh, places where we can look and see decline, but on the other hand, I'm going to suggest that there are some things uh, that make it hopeful for our traditional dispensationalists, and I want you to leave with a positive uh, spirit about those things. So I want to be an encouragement today, and not just be someone who sounds the death knell of uh, what's going on. We have two parts to my presentation today. Uh, there is the historical development aspect and the question of decline. I'll be spending about the same amount of time on each one, I believe. So we begin with the historical development, and there are four areas that I want to talk about. I want to talk about precursors of dispensationalism, or to dispensationalism, that is pre-Darby elements of dispensationalism. I do want to talk about Darby, and I want to spend some time there to rehabilitate his image, because I think he was a good man, and I think he's being shafted by some of the portrayals of him, especially by the Covenant camp. I also want to talk about the Niagara Bible Conference uh, in North America, and then I want to talk about 20th century America uh, and uh, the developments of dispensationalism uh, that we can find there. So we start with precursors to dispensationalism. Uh, I have the Facebook picture of Irenaeus up on the screen there. Irenaeus is a second century uh, church father. I date him with 170. That's a date to help me remember that he is in the second half uh, of the second century. Irenaeus is famous for being the first uh, theologian, apologist, uh, religious writer for Christianity uh, who proposed a uh, a scheme that had seven 1,000 year periods of earth history. 6,000 years and then the second coming of Christ and then the thousand years of the millennial kingdom. He has a second coming at the end of the 6,000 years. He does not have a two-faced second coming but he has a second coming followed by resurrection and uh, then the millennial kingdom. And a lot of the details of the dispensations, the eras of history, the way he talks, the way he thinks, uh, remind us of some of the later formulations of dispensationalism. Now, he was in a time when there is a rise of Christian chiliasm as opposed to a more Jewish understanding of Old Testament promises. Chiliasm is the old word for what we today call premillennialism. Uh, and the chiliasm of the second century had dropped out the Jewish temple. So the Jewish temple no longer has a place in the eschatology of most of the Christians then. That's not to, not surprising in light of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. I can see why some Christians would think that. However, they do not do away with Jerusalem as a city, uh, so they do keep a little bit of Jewish things there, but they're seeing things through a Christian framework. Replacement theology is beginning to creep in, even in the late second century. But it's important to note that we have in the early church, I think the first three centuries, dominance of premillennialism. That begins to fade in the third century. Amillennialism rises to the top and amillennialism will dominate uh, the church for 13 centuries at least until we get down to the Reformation. Uh, however, we know that premillennialism continues in fact, I, I believe premillennialism never goes off of the scene altogether and, and has to be revived. I think it's always there. We see an example of this uh, in the statements of Jerome. Jerome uh, is late 300s, early 400s, contemporary of Augustine. He is an amillennialist, 
and he is complaining about the fact that the churches in the suburbs ringing around Alexandria had become premillennial and the bishop of uh, Alexandria had to go to all those churches to try to bring them back into the amillennial family so we see things like that and throughout uh, history and especially at the early church there are some strong indicators that match what would be later formulations of dispensationalism there is also throughout church history evidence of a two-phase second coming in the writings of others besides John Nelson Darby he is not the first one to come up with that the most famous and, and perhaps the most controversial uh, one is pseudo Ephraim in the late 4th to the early 7th century is the uh, dating for it. That's based upon the internal evidence of the battles between the Romans um, and the Persians, and there are several of those in history to choose from. Ephraim himself was a Syriac father from the late 4th century. And there are two things that are important about this writing. as It is a medieval sermon that's been given to us in written form. The two things that are important are, number one, it has a clear two-phase second coming. Now, the tribulation period is only three and a half years long, if I understand it right, but it has a two-phase second coming. The second thing is that it looks at the details of prophecy, it looks at the text that are the same text that dispensationalists look at today uh, for their eschatology, and it studies them in the same way. It's in the Daniel text, Daniel 9, and other texts. Thinking about the abomination of desolation, it's in Matthew 24. And looking at the statements of Jesus in that uh, presentation, it's looking at Revelation chapter 6 to 19. It is dealing with questions of the identity of the Antichrist. He's, it's dealing with questions of the identity of the two witnesses. And a lot of the exegetical details, uh, it has a concern about in the same way that dispensationalists would have a concern about. Not that all those details are a high level importance, but at the same time uh, he reflects an interest in the details of the text. Second is a brother to Sino, a Roman Catholic around 1300. I wish I had more time to develop uh, number two and number three here. Uh, but a two-phase second coming, this was brought to our attention by a non-dispensationalist. And then uh, the pastor Morgan Edwards from the 1700s, which predates Darby. And I'm really excited about the uh, pre-trib study group in Dallas, Texas coming up in December. Dr. William Watson is going to make a presentation and uh, he's going to show us some new discoveries of uh, pre-trib rapturists in the 1600s and the 1700s. And I think as these studies in history increase, you know, things have never been studied like this before. I think we're going to kill the idea that John Nelson Darby invented the two-phase second coming. We need to deal with Darby, even though he's not the originator of the uh, two-phase second coming idea. He is an important figure. He appears on the scene at a time of dissidence and separatism. We're in the post-Napoleonic era. Uh, the, the culture is, uh, of Western Europe is putting itself back together. A lot of people were flocking to Bible studies to try to make sense of the world. And in Trinity College in Dublin, where Darby graduates in 1819, there are those kinds of discussions. Uh, he graduates in law. He's a very good student and graduates with a medallion award. But he changes course in his life shortly thereafter, and he becomes an Anglican priest in 1826. He has some contact with Robert Daly, the Anglican rector chaplain of Powers Court, comes into play a little bit later. And he has, and this is very important, I want you to understand the heart of Darby. He had a successful ministry, winning poor Catholics in the Dublin area to faith in Christ. He would ride his horse to the farms and the villages on the outskirts of Dublin. And he would speak to small groups and large groups, and he was very persuasive. And people were coming to the Christ in the hundreds. Darby loved the souls of people. But the Anglicans did not trust, the Anglican leaders, the Anglican church leaders, did not trust these conversions. And so they had a problem with that. They wanted to 
place upon the people an extra necessity to pledge allegiance to the King of England. And so they told, basically told Darby to knock it off. If they weren't going to do that, they shouldn't be reaching these poor Catholics. And that offended Darby. In fact, it disturbed Darby to the bottom of his soul. And as a result, he begins his move away from the Anglican Church. He believes that the Anglican Church has inserted political things into a spiritual matter where it has no business being. I have a picture there of John Nelson Darby in his youth. Uh, a pleasant picture, a little bit different than this picture. I think the reform guys like to use this picture. Shows Darby, uh, you can imagine him being a little more stern and mean-spirited uh, with this uh, older picture of him. Darby has an accident riding a horse in 1827. And during his healing time, which is rather extensive after that, he spends his time almost reading the Bible entirely. That's all he does. I'm sure he talks to some people. I'm sure he does a few other things. But overwhelmingly, his main task is reading the Bible. And as he studies, he comes to the conclusion that the kingdom of the Old Testament was not the church. They are not the same thing. So he has come to a distinction between Israel and the church. What moves him that way is primarily his view of the church as a spiritual entity not tied to earthly powers. So his views of prophecy begin to develop and they emerge, his eschatology emerges out of his ecclesiology. Now in 1831 to 33, Darby participates in the Powers Court conferences. There's the, the front picture uh, portrait uh, on a book uh, showing the Powers Court estate. It still exists. It's a hotel resort center today. And Lady Powers Court was a widow. She was very interested in prophecy. And for several years, she had a prophecy conference uh, that she hosted there. Uh, and she had one or 200 people who would come for those conferences stay for a few days not unlike our modern conferences uh, and they would have presentations and interaction and discussion uh, it's at uh, the meeting I think the 1832 meeting where Darby announces his view of the ruined church uh, primarily thinking about the Anglican church and the pre-trib rapture He also, as a little side note, has a relationship to the widow Lady Powers Court. They are engaged, but later he breaks that off. Uh, and the reason that is given is that he uh, felt that an itinerant ministry that he felt led of the Lord to do in terms of evangelism and teaching would not be conducive to ministering to the needs of a wife. We need to understand that Darby was an astounding individual. He helped develop the Plymouth Brethren. Uh, they view themselves as a movement more than a denomination. In the 1840s, there's a controversy that he has with Benjamin Newton. In the 1830s, Darby's tribulation is only three and a half years, much like pseudo Ephraim. But by the 1840s, he has correlated that with the 70 weeks of Daniel. So he has a full seven-year tribulation period, which I think is correct. Uh, Newton goes with a post-trib approach, Darby with a pre-trib, and so there's a division in the Plymouth Brethren as a result. Uh, Darby has an itinerant ministry, uh, Geneva, Italy, Germany. He's three times in the United States. I've left France off the list uh, accidentally. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time in France. He has uh, basically, as the course of his life, evangelism at the center with uh, Bible teaching, simple Bible teaching, verse by verse through the Bible. And he is a great scholar. He translated the entire Bible. He is multilingual. Tommy Ice at the Barn Dollar Lectures at Baptist Bible Seminary a few years ago made the statement that Darby is in the top five in the history of the church in volume of writing. Now you stop and think, who would the other four be? Well, you have to put Augustine in that. You have to put Aquinas in that. You have to put Luther and Calvin in that. So the fifth one would be Darby. Uh, that's interesting company of people who have impacted Christianity. And uh, Darby 
has left us a tremendous treasure trove of written material. So we should not be ashamed of him in his character, him in his church life, him in his work for the Lord. Uh, we should not be ashamed to call him the father of modern dispensationalism. We won't agree with every little thing that he says, but we should have respect for the legacy that he has left to us. I move thirdly to the Niagara Bible Conference. I have a picture there of James Brooks, uh, who was a Presbyterian pastor in St. Louis. He is a dispensationalist. In 1868, a conference starts in New York City, headed by James Inglis. Inglis dies a couple years later. And in 1875, the annual meeting is reconstituted under Brooks' leadership. Now, this is a national conference held in the summer. People from all over North America come, usually six, seven hundred folks. The meeting is usually held at Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario, and you see a picture there of the Queen's Royal Hotel at that place. That's where most of the people stayed, and on the other side of those trees is a pavilion, uh, a tabernacle kind of pavilion, where the meetings were held in the summertime. The conference was interdenominational and solidly premillennial. I had a doctrinal statement. Premillennialism was in the doctrinal statement, but pre-trib was not. So the, the people who come are a mixture of pre- and post-trib and other positions. Uh, when Brooks dies in 1897, Gabeline and Schofield become the spiritual leaders of the pre-trib camp, but they're not able to keep the national conference together, and in 1901, it ends as a result of this controversy. What this conference did do was help spread dispensationalism, dispensational ideas, premillennial ideas through the United States for all these people coming to the conference. I thought it might be helpful to see some uh, arrows uh, showing relationships of influence uh, throughout history. Darby has some impact on Emil Gare, French pastor in Geneva. Uh, it goes both ways. The arrow, Gare, influenced him as well. Gare wrote a book called The Future of Israel in 1856. That book uh, is partly the reason that Gabeline, Arno C. Gabeline, switches from a postmillennialist position to a premillennialist position. Darby influences Gabeline indirectly through the Niagara Conference and the people, uh, the Plymouth Brethren who were there that represent Darby's position. Uh, Darby, in the same way, influences Brooks. Uh, I have a dotted line there, a big line uh, on purpose. There's some debate here. I personally think Darby's influence upon Brooks was direct. Uh, he traveled to St. Louis as part of his trips to the United States. Uh, I believe he met Brooks there. I believe he probably preached in Brooks Church. I have not been able yet to find the evidence to prove uh, my supposition, and I hope that I'll do that eventually. Uh, Brooks certainly influences Gabeline and Schofield. As understudies of his, Schofield is pastoring a congregational church in St. Louis down the road from Brooks. And both Gabeline and Schofield impact another young man, Lewis Berry Chafer, who started a school that became Dallas Theological Seminary, the mecca of dispensationalism in North America, if not the world. And of course, Chafer influenced another young man you may have heard of, Charles Caldwell Ryrie. And Ryrie has influenced me, he's influenced many of you here in this room. And so there is a legacy of dispensational influence uh, that we can look at and, and see actual connections. Now in terms of our sketch in 20th century America, I've got three pictures on the left hand side. I'm sure you recognize those three men, but let's look at uh, how the 20th century has, has seen the development of dispensationalism. First off, after the fall of the Niagara Conference, regional conferences emerge. New York City, Philadelphia, Denver, California, Canada, the Midwest. And interestingly, now that you have regional conferences instead of one national conference, it actually helps as these guys who are the speakers go to all the regions of the country now and there is a I think an intensification and spreading of dispensationalism because of this. The Schofield Reference Bible in 1909 and 1917 is something that 
we really cannot understate in terms of influence. This Bible uh, was is kind of sketchy compared to our study Bibles today, but it was extremely influential, and it bypassed the academy. It didn't go through the schools and then down to the pastors and churches. Uh, it went from the publisher straight to the bookstore, straight to the people in the churches. The pastors bought it. Others bought it. It was spread at conferences. It was spread around as dispensationalists crisscrossed the country. And this Bible was so influential, we see some of the pushback in the 1930s, very strong uh, against uh, this rising dispensationalism. But there's also Our Hope magazine, uh, Arno C. Gabeline edited Our Hope magazine from 1894 to 1945. This magazine was the number one circulating magazine in the United States. It was on the kitchen tables and side tables in the living rooms of a lot of evangelical Bible-believing Christians. And Gabeline carried that magazine with him in his itinerant Bible teaching ministry. As he crisscrossed the country, Our Hope magazine was a Bible study magazine some uh, talk about current events and things happening relative to Israel. Uh, this magazine kept dispensational understandings of the scripture in the hearts and minds of people. Then we come to World War I. Well, how does that impact dispensationalism? World War I, if you remember, was Woodrow Wilson's War to End All Wars. Wilson had the post-millennial dream. What World War I actually accomplished was it caused the post-millennial optimism concerning the human race to begin to dissipate. In the 1800s, post-millennialism was overwhelmingly the view of evangelical Bible-believing Christians. World War I was a shock to their understanding. We also have, about the same time, the modernist controversy, and new schools start. The fundamentalists lose most of the major mainline denominations, so they start their own schools, start their own libraries, start their own ministries and denominations and fellowships. And interestingly, most of these new schools, not all, but most of them, are dispensational. So now you have a new network of schools scattered throughout the United States and Canada who are practicing dispensational truth and are inculcating that in their students. Then we have in the 1940s Chafer Systematic Theology that kind of codifies the discussions that have been going on and the teaching now that's been going on in the classroom. We have World War II and the Holocaust in the 40s and this finishes off what World War I had started. After World War II, after the Jewish Holocaust, it is very hard to find a post-millennialist in the 1950s. There are some. We have Lorraine Bettner, for example. But they declined from being number one in the, in the country all the way down to number three. All mill number two, premillennialism, is at the top of the heap the top of the list. It's the number one view now among those who are Bible-believing Christians in America. And there's this surge of uh, parachurch ministries, almost all of them premillennial, right after World War II. You have the New Schofield Reference Bible in 1967, which helps to keep dispensationalism uh, on the lips of people as they talk about things. And then we have these three guys, the pictures I have up. Hal Lindsey, Charles Ryrie, and Tim LaHaye. Hal Lindsey, at the top there, his picture, 1969, he wrote a book, The Late Great Planet Earth. In the 70s and 80s, at one time, it was the second best-selling book next to the Bible. Now, we may not agree with some of the theology and the details that Lindsey presents, but one of the things that his book presented was the plot line and the outline of dispensational eschatology, of dispensational premillennialism. And that outline through Hal Lindsey's book is embedded in pop culture. Even non-Christians are reading the book and they have that outline in their minds. 
Then we have Charles Ryrie in 1965, a few years earlier, has academically kind of codified a definition for dispensationalism. Literal interpretation, distinction between Israel and the church, doxological unifying theme of the Bible. All discussions since then have kind of looked at that as a hallmark and something by which they can compare and analyze. And then we have Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye, along with Jerry Jenkins, gave us the Left Behind series starting in the 1990s. You run into people in the airports, as I did, reading that. There are still people reading it, and there are thousands of people who came to Christ. And just like the prior generation with Hal Lindsey's book, I think another generation through LaHaye's writings and Jerry Jenkins' writings, through the Left Behind series, there has been a further embedding of the dispensational premillennial outline of history in the hearts and minds of people, some of whom are not Christians, and some of whom are not dispensationalists. And so this has kept dispensationalism on the table of ideas in our culture, even when there are those who oppose us. Now, that finishes our discussion of historical development. I want to move to the question of decline. That's really what we want to find out about. In light of all these, this historical development, are we now on the way out? Is dispensationalism in decline? And my answer is yes and no. Now, before you start charging me with being a postmodern theologian, who believes in multiple cho choice theology. I want to let you know I'm not running for President of the United States. I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth at the same time. What I'm doing is trying to be honest with the historical facts. Yes, there are places where there's evidence of decline, but also there are things that are happening in our culture that give us hope that maybe the statement that dispensationalism is in decline is overstated. Let's look at evidence of decline on that side of the question. And we begin with literature that's against dispensationalism and you think of something in decline, you think okay, it's something that's being attacked and pushed down. <coughs> and, we, and I'll give you a few uh, samples. We obviously can't uh, look at everything that's been written against dispensationalism. But on the heels of the Left Behind series coming out in the 1990s, there is a pushback. And we see Tim Weber, a former dispensationalist, who writes the book in 2004, On the Road to Armageddon. Uh, the subtitle is How Evangelicals Became Israel's Best Friend. It's not a good book, historically. Uh, in an early chapter, he talks about the millennial movements in America. And he talks about the Seventh-day Adventist he talks about the Jehovah Witnesses, talks about the Mormons, and he talks about others, all cult groups. And in the middle of that, he slides in John Nelson Darby and the Plymouth Brethren. Now, he does say that they're orthodox and not cultish, but the damage is done. He, by guilt by association, he's, he's kind of left the impression near the beginning of his book uh, that Darby is strange and a little cultish. You also have uh, Hensel, probably a little more... Uh, serious work, Darby, Dualism, and the Decline of Dispensationalism, a year earlier in 2003. Actually, out in the open, talks about decline and sees dispensationalism as on the move down. We also see in the newspapers, Nicholas Kristof, for example, I don't know if you've read any of his stuff, uh, but in the, he's one of the religion uh, writers for the New York Times. He is at best agnostic. Uh, and uh, once or twice a year, he takes on conservative Christians in his editorials uh, and uh, at times attacks the Left Behind series and the views that come out of the Left Behind series, Preacher of Rapture, etc. On the right-hand side there, I have Tom Cratemaker. Uh, I have interacted with him. I've interacted with Christoph in writing. With Tom Cratemaker, I've actually emailed several times back and forth with him. He's a religion writer for the USA Today newspaper. He wrote a book a few years ago entitled Evangelicals in Sports. I wrote a critique of that, sent it to him. We kind of bantered back and forth a little bit uh, discussing things. Well, a year ago, August, he wrote almost a full page article in USA Today 
attacking the pre-trib rapture view and what it meant for culture uh, caricaturing us uh, in my opinion of course to be sure with these kinds of things out there and these are just a few small samples uh, you would think that uh, you know we're we're kind of a, a lowly group that's being pounded upon but on the other hand you need to take some heart the fact that we're getting this kind of criticism means that we still have some clout or they or we wouldn't be worth criticizing so I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. When we talk about evidence of decline, I think what most people think of is the rise of progressive dispensationalism. I'll call that PD from here on out, and traditional dispensationalism, I'll call it TD. Well, uh, PD started in the middle 1980s, three major proponents, Darrell Bach and Craig Blazing from Dallas Seminary. Blazing has moved on to uh, Southwestern Seminary and Sosi from Talbot Seminary. I have a three-hour presentation where I talk about the differences between PD and TD. What are the issues? Well, we have some hermeneutical questions, theological method questions, uh, but probably at the heart of most of the discussions is the idea of whether or not we are already in the Messianic Kingdom. I don't know about you, but if you look out the window there in Duluth, I don't think you will find the kingdom. I know if you look out the window here in the Scranton, Pennsylvania area, if you've been reading anything about Scranton, you know that the kingdom has not arrived in Scranton. But the PD guys very seriously believe that the Messianic kingdom has been inaugurated. That is the kingdom promised to David. And so Jesus is reigning on the throne of David in heaven right now, pouring out uh, spiritual blessings through the church and that is Davidic reign fulfillment of the Davidic promises it is phase one or the inauguration of the kingdom when Jesus returns there will be the consummation of the Davidic kingdom the second phase and there will be a national future for Israel so they're with us on that the debate is over the present age and all the ramifications that come with that As a result of the rise of PD, there's been a decline of TD at major schools. At Dallas Seminary, large number of faculty members are PD. At Grace Seminary, one of the other great dispensational schools in, in our heritage, uh, there, has, there have been some PD guys. And I, I mentioned Philadelphia Biblical University also. Uh, that's the old PCB, Philadelphia College of the Bible that uh, used to be the place where Ryrie was president uh, and a few years ago it announced that it is no longer a dispensational school it wants to be a mixed bag have some covenant guys some uh, dispensational guys some other guys probably trying to be all things to all people in the evangelical world what are some of the reasons for decline uh, there are four areas I want to mention linguistics, science, postmodernism, and reform resurgence. I want to start with linguistics, and there is Friedrich Nietzsche. He should not be on anybody's favorite list of philosophers. In 1888, he, he wrote this I am afraid we are not rid of God because we still have faith in grammar. Now, what does this mean? There's a context, obviously, by which he applies that in that particular writing. But from him, there's this fountain, this strand of linguistic studies since then that has attempted to undermine language so that language is inadequate to speak absolutely about anything. And if you do that, you can undermine the very existence of God. As a matter of fact, uh, this movement basically believes that language is a social convention. It was not something invented by God, not something created by God. Now, this movement has impacted hermeneutics greatly. Now, not everything in linguistic studies is bad, by the way. I don't mean to paste all of it. I'm just saying there's a strand, and this has impacted greatly the development of hermeneutics. You have a text that's an object that can be known 
dispensationalists look at our text and we believe that the meaning lies with the text. It's in the intended meaning of the author as revealed in his text. But there is a reader as a subject that comes to the text and many folks believe that the reader brings meaning to the text and in the debate between Gadamer and Hirsch, Ger Hirsch argued for meaning in the text, Gadamer argued for a mixture of meaning in the text, meaning coming from the author, I mean from the reader. Of course, uh, later developments are even more radical, and so that you have reader response, where readers determine the meanings of text, the text do not yield meanings for the reader. An example of this is uh, Al Gore, several years ago in a debate with George W. Bush made the statement that the Constitution is a living, breathing document that changes meaning with time. In other words, later readers determine the meaning of the written Constitution. Uh, I don't hold to that view. And you apply that to the Bible, you can see exactly how they would take it. Later readers can make the Bible say whatever they want to say. And that, that strand of linguistic study that hermeneutical change is totally incompatible with dispensationalism and as that has risen in the culture dispensationalism is not accepted. I want to similarly say relative to scientific presentations we have some similar things. Uh, there is a picture of an atom. Uh, it's a very orderly sweet picture. Um, but in reality they tell us that the electrons spinning around the nucleus of an atom are not like this. They are random inside that shell and they are unpredictable. You can predict where a planet is going to be, you can predict eclipses, you can predict when Halley's Comet is coming back around, but you cannot predict where an electron is going to be. In fact there is the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty that I was taught in my physics classes I've always thought that ironic that you have a mathematical theorem showing with certainty the principle of uncertainty. Along with that you have relativism, the theory of relativity, where the observer and his role in looking at things changes what you see. The perspective of the observer changes what the physics looks like. Now, if you think that's the way reality is, focuses on the observer, not on nature. Same way that there's in written in study of written text, there's focus on the reader and not on the written texts. So this feeds a culture that leads to uncertainty and relativism. That's not in harmony with the idea that truth can be known and that God is speaking to us certainly in the Word of God. Now all of this is our streams, a couple of the streams that come into postmodernism. Now I know you're talking, you're tired of talking about this. I am too, but it's necessary for us to deal with it. I have four words that define postmodernism. Uh, I'll not bore you with it. I'll run through it quickly. Mysticism, relativism. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Uh, there's tolerance, and, there, and they have practice tolerance for anybody except those who don't believe in absolute truth. Then I have a bigger circle for uncertainty. Think of Rob Bell's book here, Love Wins. Didn't Rob Bell ask a lot of questions? Now it's not wrong to ask questions. Jesus asked questions, but he always asked questions to teach toward truth. Rob Bell asked questions, and others like him ask questions to make sure that everything is hanging up in the air uncertainty is what is needed. And in this postmodern mindset, again, with the rise of postmodern thought, we see something that's totally contrary to dispensationalism, and as that captures culture, dispensationalism does not look as attractive as it used to look. And so there's a reason for decline. The fourth reason is something different than those other three. The other three are related. This one is not. It's the Reformed Resurgence. I have a picture of Al Mohler as an example. We can think of the Gospel Coalition. We can think of Together for the Gospel. Uh, and all of this Reformed Resurgence movement is pushed back against a vacuous Arminian spirit of, the, of our age. 
think here of Joel Osteen and Lakewood Church where there's no clear gospel there's Arminianism there's an extreme Arminianism and I personally uh, eschew labels I don't like to be called a Calvinist or an Arminian I don't like people to label me on those things uh, but you think of Lakewood Church no clear gospel prosperity theology everything is ambiguous and the reform resurgence has responded to them the reformed resurgence is not responding to dispensationalists now unfortunately though along with their resurgence comes anti-dispensationalism students come in with that reform mindset they are attracted to some of the solutions about the gospel which I don't hold to all of their solutions about the gospel, but uh, the st our students come into our, our school, our dispensational school, and they have a lot of questions, and they come in with a spirit of anti-dispensationalism. And that's all because of the Reformed resurgence. So, in light of all these things, is dispensationalism on the decline? You may recognize this guy great theologian working for ESPN. He's part of the game day crowd. They made at various games across the country uh, and they make predictions about football games, college football games. And when one of his buddies makes a prediction that he doesn't like, he says this, not so fast my friend. And so for those of you who think that dispensationalism is in such decline, it's totally going out the door, in our North American climate I say to you not so fast my friend I want to give you seven reasons that dispensationalism is not as bad off as some people think number one is pop culture remember what we've said so far about pop culture we've had the left behind series we had uh, Hal Lindsey's late great planet earth we had the Schofield Bible all those were dealing with people at the basic level of culture not going through the academy not going through some elite and we have to think about that as a positive remember dispensationalism is a movement more of the churches than of the schools I think we should can take some encouragement from that they think we're off the scene they turn around there we are again they think we're off the scene, there's Left Behind series. They think we're off the scene, there's the Schofield Reference Bible. We have a lot going for us because our outline of history is still there in the minds of people. Then there are new schools popping up all over North America. I can think of uh, Tyndale and Fort Worth started 20 years or so ago. I think of uh, Chafer Theological Seminary. I think of other schools in Denver and California and other parts of the country. There are many new schools that have started, many of them dispensational, many of them started in response to what was perceived decline at places like Dallas Seminary. But then there are also old schools that are strengthening. The president of Dallas Seminary is a traditional dispensationalist, and he is leading them to hire uh, more traditional dispensationalists, I've been told. Grace Seminary is making moves back toward traditional dispensationalism. Even at uh, BBS, Baptist Bible Seminary, uh, we in our past, you go back several years, and we've had people who were not traditional dispensationalists, but uh, at our seminary today, we only have traditional dispensationalists. And then there are new publications. Uh, let me just have a shameful commercial here about a book that's at the printer right now that I edited uh, entitled Dispensational Understanding of the New Covenant came out of the Council on Dispensational Hermeneutics in 2009 uh, Regular Baptist Press is the publisher they're stepping up to the plate as many other publishers are uh, since so many of the old publishers will not publish dispensational materials new publishers arise and I appreciate them stepping up to the plate and doing that. And, but these new publications will continue and they will grow. Then there are new conferences. I'm encouraged by our Council on Dispensational Hermeneutics. Uh, we meet every other year at our school, Baptist Bible Seminary. But every other year we go around the country to different places. 
We were in Houston recently. Uh, then we'll be back at our place next year, and the year after that we'll be at some other place in the country, going around the country, out in the west, in the Midwest, uh, northwest, and the southeast, uh, all over. Uh, and I've, I've been encouraged by the interaction of faculty members who have joined us and pastors who have come to be part of our discussions and deliberations. Uh, I'm encouraged by that. I do not see a people who who uh, feel as if or act as if we are not uh, not taking the not taking the field. We still have a lot of clout, and I want you to see that. I want to land on this one for a little while. Inconsistency of criticisms. Now we have long felt that the criticisms of dispensationalism have largely been unfair, uh, almost bizarre. We're the people that throw away the entire Old Testament in spite of the fact the Bible says all scripture is profitable. And so we throw away the Ten Commandments. We're also the people that throw away the Sermon on the Mount. We're also the people that don't believe in obedience as a category. We just hate that. Uh, our view of sanctification is laissez-faire. We believe in cheap grace. There are a lot of strange, bizarre criticisms. But let me share one with you that you ought to take to the bank as an encouragement, a strong encouragement. You go back to those books I showed you in 2003-2004, Dispensationalism in Decline, Darby, Dualism, and the Decline of Dispensationalism. It's very interesting at that same time, Knox Seminary was writing its open letter to evangelicals. At the same time, other writings were coming out, and dispensationalists were being accused of controlling the foreign policy of President Bush in the Middle East. Now stop and think about that for just a minute. How can we be in such great decline at the same time that we control the thing of a United States President? And by the way, Bush was not and is not a dispensationalist. Think about that. Something's wrong in the analysis. And then finally, I want to talk about Middle Eastern events. A lot of strange stuff going on in the Middle East. It's been a bad year in the Middle East. It looks like it's going to get worse. And Israel is between a rock and a hard place. And that seems to have always been true. I want you to know, I don't preach the newspaper. I don't do newspaper exegesis. I preach the Bible, the Word of God. I don't set dates. I don't speculate unless I label things clearly as speculation so that people do not confuse any speculation with the Word of God. I believe in futurism. My literal hermeneutic leads me to a futurist position. The rapture, the tribulation, uh, events, and the kingdom, the second coming and the kingdom, all of those are future from our perspective. And I do not map those to current events. However, it is possible that the current events of our time are the setup for the end time days. I don't know that for sure. It's possible. We'll know that when we get to the end time days. We do know that Israel has to be in the land for the end time day things to occur. And so we can take hope in that. But here's my point. As long as things in the Middle East are riled up, like they have been since 1948, our dispensational understanding of the scriptures will always be on the table for discussion. And what's happening in the Middle East makes sure that dispensationalism is always discussed. I think that's a reason that you can have hope that dispensationalism is not really in the tank. Jesus literally is coming back. History is going somewhere. Dispensationalism is not just eschatology. It's a hermeneutic. It's a philosophy of history. But that history is going somewhere. It's ending up in the concrete, literal coming of Jesus to the earth, putting his feet on the Mount of Olives, watching through, walking through the Golden Gate, and reigning as the messianic king of Israel and the world that is taking place and this 
wonderful Christ who shed his blood for us on Calvary's cross so that we could be saved by simple grace alone through faith alone in him alone. This wonderful Jesus who has given us this Bible that we can read at face value and understand to a large degree is someone we will never be ashamed of. And our dispensationalism is just a way of talking about our literal, straightforward understanding of what God has told us. And in that, we should never be ashamed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your written word. Thank you for Jesus, who died on the cross to give us everlasting life. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us in our understanding of theology, hermeneutics, our approach to the Bible, as we put things together and help us to think your thoughts after you. Help us to appreciate our legacy and those who have done some of the hard legwork of theology before us. And help us to continue and do our best to share the truth as we see it in the Bible. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.